Uh, well, hey, good morning. Thank you for being with us. Good morning, or wherever this finds you, whether it's morning, afternoon, when you're watching it. Thank you for being with us today. As Pastor Jermaine hilariously said, we are in the second part of our Wait on God series, and uh, the message today is Wait on God Together. Now, we are in a season, season of waiting. We have all been physically waiting longer than I think we ever have in our generation. If you think about it, we've had everything so quickly throughout life that this season's like, oh my gosh, waiting, everything is taking so much longer. When are we going to get out of quarantine? How can we get our lines moving faster? Like we're just waiting all the time. And the thing about waiting is waiting has a way of bringing out the stuff that is deep within us. So, for example, earlier this week, I was at Lowe's buying some tiger lilies, the manliest flower, uh, don't judge me, buying some tiger lilies for my flower bed. And we go to Lowe's and we go and purchase that, uh, some flowers and a couple of other things. And as we uh, were checking out, there's a man in front of us who had about 20 different items. And so the 15-year-old cashier was checking one item, two item, three item, and the man goes to pay. He goes to swipe his credit card, and when he does that, basically the internet shuts down. The internet in the whole building was no longer working. And this 15-year-old cashier, I don't think had ever heard no internet in his entire life. And so he is... Like, well, what do I do? And there's this piece of paper, and he goes and begins to write one item, one by one by one by one. I'm sitting there patiently, six feet away, of course, and I'm watching the line get longer and longer and longer. And we wait five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. The line is now 35 feet because of the six-foot distance And eventually he checks him out, gets his credit card number, and the guy leaves. Well, now there's this huge, massive line, and this kid has never been trained on a life without swiping a credit card for his job. And so literally on the job, the manager is teaching him how to do this old, new way of cashing people out. And so I'm still waiting. It gets to 30 minutes, 35 minutes, 40 minutes. There's literally 20 people in line. Eventually... The lady behind me takes the two flower pots in her hands and she throws them down and she does that quick walk that you just know she's angry and she's had enough. Waiting brings out the deepest stuff within us and especially when we have to wait longer and longer and longer. And so maybe for you, you've already had that throwing the flower pot moment or maybe you're just about there and you're like, ah, I just can't take it any longer. Well, we're in this series And the message today is called Wait on God Together because more than ever, we need to press in to one another together. Hebrews 3.13 says um, that uh, to encourage one another as long as it's called today so that our hearts do not become hardened to sin's deceitfulness. And really the thrust and the point of my message today is I want to ask the question, what would it look like If individually, we as a church, whether you're a part of the Waypoint family or um, uh, uh, just visiting this morning, whatever, what would it look like if if we all pressed in to the Spirit of God and said, Jesus, do a work in me? What would our church look like when we all come together after quarantine if we all pressed into the Spirit of God? Well, we'd become beautiful. One of my life goals The reason I'm in ministry is to see a beautiful church. And if you look at church history, one of the very amazing things about revival and spiritual renewal is it often comes on the back end of crisis. It happens right at the end of crisis because typically what happens in moments of crisis is people get to the end of themselves and they experience the fullness and the power of God. And so what would it look like if in this moment we pressed into Jesus and said, I want to encounter that power so when quarantine's over, we can be a part of a revival. We can be a part of what God is going to do in pouring out his spirit in the world. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump in and talk about what that looks like. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, we thank you that we can gather, even if it isn't uh, in person, but we can still be together via screens. And thank you that you still want to move, that you still want to change hearts, that you still want to make us more like you, that you still want to use us. And I pray that as I preach this morning, God, that you would allow us um, to step in to what you're doing. Lord, that you would allow us to open up our hands and say, God, have your way in me. I'm trusting you. So God, speak through me, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, if we're talking about pressing into Jesus, if we're talking about allowing God to do a work in us, the first thing we need to do is talk about the Holy Spirit. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and go to John 14. We're gonna look at verses 15 through 18. And starting in verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, You will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So think about this. Do you understand the role of the Holy Spirit in your life? I I kind of grew up in a church tradition that often talked about the Trinity being God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible. There wasn't as much talk about the Spirit, and yet the Spirit is the one who transforms us and makes us uh, like Jesus. See, man has two great needs, one for forgiveness and one for goodness. The first happened at Calvary, the second came at Pentecost, or as Billy Graham put it, I need Jesus Christ for my eternal life, and I need the Holy Spirit for my internal life. And it's interesting that when the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2, followers of God, followers of Jesus are never the same. They are radically and completely transformed. It's because of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus says, over and over and over again toward the end of his ministry that it's better, it's better for me to leave. It's better that I'm no longer physically here because I'll send you my spirit. Think about that. Imagine being the disciples and, and, and hearing, Jesus, you're saying that it is better for you to physically be gone because we'll receive your spirit. What's all that about? It's because the spirit is Literally the power and the presence of God. When you become a born-again Christian, God puts his very spirit within you. And what happens is the Holy Spirit, he doesn't come into your heart. He doesn't come into your life, sit on the couch, start eating food, watching documentaries and taking your stuff. No, that is not the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, he is a giver. Jesus says, I'm going to send you a helper. Another word for helper is comforter. See, if you're a Christian, because the Holy Spirit, you're never alone. Because the Holy Spirit, in your hardest times, God is with you. Because the Holy Spirit's there, you can always have access to peace. No, long, no, no matter how chaotic it is around you, you can have peace within you. It's because the comforter is there. The Holy Spirit's there, and he puts his presence there. The second thing the Holy Spirit does is he is power. He's power. I think one of the best ways to illustrate this is um, using the word wind. In both the Greek and the Hebrew, in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament, Uh, the Holy Spirit is often referred to using language of wind. Now, wind is something here, if you're from the Midwest, we understand very clearly. We live in the plains. When we get a windstorm, I mean, it can knock down trees. It can knock down branches. It can flip chairs outside across your, your yard. It's not uncommon to be in the Midwest and see a tornado happening. I saw my very first one two years ago. Wind is powerful. Now, what happens when you put a kite in the wind. 
when I was about eight years old, um, we used to go to this field, and on windy days, we would take a kite. Now, kites are basically like two pieces of wood with plastic, right? And there's a, a string that's put on the end of them. And what, what we would do as kids is we'd kind of give it about six foot, and then we would start running, and we'd hope that it would catch the wind. And once it caught the wind, we'd just release string, and the kite would fly up, and it would lift, and it would dance, and it would move, and it would, it would soar. When the wind's strong, the kite flies. When there's no wind, the kite dies, right? In the same way, the power of the Holy Spirit is like that. We as believers are like kites, and the Holy Spirit is the one who lifts us up. He helps us to soar. He helps us to fly. He allows us to be the people of God that God destines for us to be. Uh, another metaphor real fast is of a wind chime. Think about a wind chime. It's, I should have brought one in so you could see it, but a wind chime is just basically metal on strings. With no wind, it does nothing. It's just a decoration. It just sits there doing nothing. But when the wind blows through, what does it do? It makes a beautiful noise. It makes music. That's a picture of of every Christian life filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit. We are people who soar, who are lifted, who are able to fly. And not only that, we are, we are those who make beautiful noise. We, we make music that glorifies God and is pleasant to the world around us. That's through the power of the Holy Spirit. So all of this, though, this life... This power that I'm talking about only is possible when we're being obedient to Jesus. I want to put it like this because oftentimes I think when we think of having the Holy Spirit within us, we almost think, well, all I need to do is just put faith in Jesus and go on living my life, and yet we miss out on just that experience of, of being filled, of liftoff, of making that be beautiful music. But to experience the power that God offers, it comes through being obedient to the person in the scriptures that God gives us. This is so key, because the third aspect, God is our, the Holy Spirit's our comfort, the Holy Spirit's our power, the Holy Spirit is also our teacher. Jesus says, in verse 16, that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. His job is to convict us of sin. His job is to remind us of the scriptures. His, God, his job is to show us how we can live and become like Jesus. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to ask you this question. In your relationship with Jesus right now, in quarantine, are you experiencing liftoff? Or do you feel like you're just a kite with no wind behind it? Are you experiencing the music of the Holy Spirit working and living and blowing right through you? Or does it just feel like an empty decoration on, on, on um, hanging from a, 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 a house? One of the ways, one of the reasons we don't experience this life and this power that God offers is because there's disobedience in our life or there's unbelief in our life. And unbelief basically says, Holy Spirit, I don't need a helper. Right? Jesus says in, in, in chapter 16, he says, I will send my helper to you. If you are someone who has believed in God, and goes on living your life completely void of God, you could not be experiencing the life that God has to offer because you don't need help. You, you, don't, you don't need anyone else. You're good. But that's joyless, and that's powerless, and that grieves the Holy Spirit. The, the second way is maybe there's uh, disobedience in your life. Disobedience grieves the Holy Spirit. Check out what Paul says in Ephesians 4. 29 through 32. He says this, do not let any unwholesome talk come from out of your mouths, 
but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. There are, are ways that we essentially poke holes in our kite. There are ways that we pull off parts of our wind chime, and that's through our disobedience. That's through perpetually living in a state where it's like, God, I'm good, I'm gonna go live however I want. And so on the screen, you should see these kind of laid out. There's eight different things. And I say all this because, again, this time in quarantine is we're pressing in together to say, God, do a work in me. And part of it is we got to have the Holy Spirit reveal to us what's going on. So is he, is he, are any of these things sticking out to you? Is there unwholesome talk coming out of your mouth that you haven't, that you haven't confessed and said, Lord, I'm sorry? Is there bitterness happening, rage, anger, brawling, slander, desires for evil? Oh, and this last one's huge, not forgiving, not forgiving. When these take a active role in our life, that doesn't allow for the Holy Spirit to work through us. But the key is, the key is, when we confess our sins, he is faithful. He is faithful to forgive us from all those things. And when we confess our sins, it's like a fresh breath of wind that comes in and again picks us up. The forgiveness one, I think, is a big one, though. Earlier this week, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine um, from the West Coast, and he's having some struggles um, within his marriage. And him and his wife are kind of on the fence right now. And he's saying, he's saying, I just, I'm trying to reconcile with her. I want there to be vibrancy in our relationship again. And I said, well, has she forgiven you? And he says, she won't. And I said, is she a Christian? And he says, yes, she professes to be. And even as hard as forgiveness is, it's one of the key things that we need to do because Forgiveness opens the pathway for the Holy Spirit to come back in our lives and bring life. And I, and I think it's so easy to live a life where we're not forgiving. But Jesus says, just as I have forgiven you, so you must forgive others. So you must forgive others. Secondly, when it comes to our relationship with God in this time of quarantine, in this moment, is your relationship with God the most vibrant part of your life? Is your relationship with Jesus above your kid's relationship, above your boyfriend or girlfriend, above your spouse, is he the most vibrant relationship you have? Because the Bible makes it really clear that he can be, that he wants to be. And, and, and our relationship with God should be the most vibrant thing. And a vibrant relationship is, think about it in human terms. When you and your spouse or your boyfriend and your girlfriend have a really good relationship happening, what, what do you feel? There's joy. There's life. There's passion. There's hope. There's encouragement. You want to be together. Church, that is God's desire for every single one of us, that we would have these passionate, vibrant real relationship with him. Not one where we get into a relationship with Jesus and at first it's really exciting, but then it becomes like a sad marriage where it's like, I'll give you a head, a head nod and I'm gonna go and do my own life and I'm not gonna think at all about you or worry about you or care about you. I'll do my thing, you'll do your thing. Church, how often does that happen today? How often do we get caught up in so many other things that we forget about the most important and vibrant relationship that we can have? In fact, the relationship that brings us life, that brings us hope, that brings us power. 
We can have access to that any time. But that means we need to reprioritize our focus. We need to relook at who the Holy Spirit is and what he wants to do in us. Because he's our comfort who will never leave us. He's our power that gives us life to live. And he's our teacher that's always going to be there to help make us more and more like Jesus. Like Jesus. Right now is the perfect time to kind of begin to reevaluate where am I at with God? Back when I was in, in youth group, one of the ways that um, I would uh, uh, communicate this is sometimes we need to go and have a DTR with God. A DTR stands for define the relationship. Every single relationship needs to have a DTR talk because a DTR is essentially a chance to say, hey, where are we at? Are we good? And what do we need to do to move forward together? As we're waiting on God, right now is the perfect time, the perfect time to have a DTR. God, where is our relationship at? Pastor Luke is talking about power. Pastor Luke is talking about a liftoff. Pastor Luke is talking about peace. I want that. Where am I at now? And where do I got to go? As Pastor Jermaine just said, um, we're, we're, we feel like we're waiting on God, but really, God's waiting on us. He's there. His power and his life are just right here. He's saying, come to me, come to me, come to me. And I say all this to say my third point, which is this. God wants to use this season of your life. James 1, 2 through 4 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I think one of the hardest things to do is to go through something difficult with joy. In fact, who would want to go through something difficult? Like, it seems like an oxymoron. The thing we need to go through something difficult is to have perspective. And the perspective that God wants to give us in this season as we're pressing into him is to say, hey, there's something I want to do in you that's going to prepare you for what I want to do through you. And if you remember back in January, before everything hit, what was the phrase that everybody was preaching about? What was the phrase that everyone was like, thank you, Pastor Matthew, for not preaching a sermon on this. But everyone was saying, this is the year of 2020 vision. Like it just became like a cliche. God's going to give us 2020 vision. And I saw a meme earlier this week that kind of just was like, it, 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 it was making fun of that. And it was like, this hits really hard now that it's April. Because in some sense, God has done just that. We're able to see things so much more clear. If you think about it, the things that we've depended on for joy, for comfort, for life, and power have all kind of been like slipped out of underneath us. The things that we look to for hope, whether that's the economy or whether that's a government, all those things are on shaky ground, and it's showing how minuscule and powerless they truly are for us. God's giving us that 2020 vision, and when you, uh, at least for me, when I look at people's reactions and responses, it's wild. It's wild. Like, in some sense, people are like, what's going on? It feels like pandemonium on Instagram and Facebook. And in this time, as we're reflecting and looking at our heart, we need to be careful that we aren't mixing the American dream with God's calling. The equation for the American dream is this. Great happiness minus hardship equals success. The Bible has a different message. Its message is not one that Jesus is going to give you the hope that you'll never have suffering ever again. The message of the Bible 
is that in hardship, in suffering, God is going to give you the strength to endure through it. That's the message of the Bible. That's God's calling. The message of success according to Scripture is that our help, our hope, our everything is found in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of the Father. In fact, the Bible is more clear that if you follow Jesus, you will have hardship. There probably will be suffering or persecution. Uh, There's probably five references on the screen right now for you. If you Google it, you can see that. It's really important that we get the proper perspective in this moment and that it's God is wanting to do something in you to prepare you for what he's going to do through you. And as I think about this moment that we find ourselves in this time, I think it's a moment of repentance, refinement, in order for there to be renewal. I talked about repentance, allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal the stuff in us that he wants to work out. What about refining? Refining is one of those super necessary things in life that only hardships can do. If you think about a diamond, a diamond's just a crystal, but when it hits pressure, it turns into the beautiful, sparkling um, creation that it is. But it only happens through the pressure, through the hardship. And what God wants to do right now is whether you find yourself in a hardship or whether this is really easy, there's still something he wants to refine. And uh, I know for me, I'll just be personal, what that's looked like for me right now is, I'm not going to lie, about the last week or two, I was having a really hard time, not physically, not emotionally, but as I was, as I was listening to people, and by listening, I, I'm, I'm talking about news, Facebook, social media, I'm hearing people just get so upset and enraged at what's happening right now. And they're upset about how hard this is. And I'm not going to lie, I was getting mad because I was thinking, are you kidding me? Like, in the grand scheme of history, this is so small. In, in, in the grand um, narrative of the Bible, like, this is minuscule compared to what other people were experiencing and feeling. And one day, as I was pressing into Jesus, the Holy Spirit said this. He said, Luke, you can be biblically correct. You can be historically accurate, but you can have the wrong attitude. And in that moment, the Lord revealed, you're right, I need refined in this area. Just because it's not hard for me right now doesn't mean it's not hard for somebody else. And who am I to start judging them? Instead of judging, I need to pray. See, the goal for every single believer is to continually, day after day after day, become more and more and more like Jesus. And the way that we can see if we're becoming more like Jesus is do we bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit? And the fruit of the Holy Spirit is this. In Galatians 5, 22 through 23, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. The goal for us in this season is tomorrow, we want to have more of the fruit of the Spirit happening in our life. The goal of this season is to look back and say, God did a work in me and refined me in such a way that I'm more loving and more patient and more kind. I have more goodness flowing through me. That's the goal for every Christian. That's what we're, we're meant to look like right now. And no matter how hard this season is for you, just remember that um, because of the gospel, though we might have hardships now, we won't have eternal hardships. Though there's suffering today, we won't have eternal suffering. Let that be the hope that continues to drive us through this season, that God is good. And he's so good and so loving that he sent his son to die for us. And the son has paid for our sins, has taken judgment, has taken the wrath of God, 
and gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit, the gift of forgiveness, the gift to become like him in the same power that he had. Regardless of the season, we have that hope. And for you, if you're listening and you're saying, man, this season's super hard. I've never, I don't have that hope. I don't have that peace. I don't have that security. You can. It comes through receiving the gospel. It comes through believing what Jesus did for you on the cross. Believing that he died for your sins. That he's made you right before God. And one day, you'll stand before him and you won't suffer eternal punishment from God but instead you'll receive more of his grace through an eternity with him. And right now you have access to the Holy Spirit when you have that relationship. So in closing, in closing, we want to become a beautiful church. When quarantine's all over, when we come back collectively together, we want to be people who are ready to use by God, to be used by God for revival. God told us to make disciples who make disciples. And when he pours out his spirit, people are gonna get saved. We wanna be people who can help lead and guide and help and serve them. We wanna be his hands and feet. And so if we individually can pursue God together, then collectively when we come back, we will be that church ready for renewal, ready for a fresh pouring of his spirit. And what that comes down to is this. We got to lean into God in this moment. What does that mean, Luke? What does it mean to lean into God right now? It means we can't just be doers of the, or hearers of the word. We need to be doers of the word. We can't just hear a nice message and say, thumbs up, I agree. But what does that actually mean for me? And so for some of you, there might be, there might be things that the Holy Spirit's brought up that's hindering your relationship with him. Time to repent of those things. Time to allow the Holy Spirit to bring wind back into your life. Some of you, some of you might need to repent of, of being extremely fearful, losing hope, not trusting God. Some of you, maybe you need to forgive others. Some of you, it's, it's the, the, what you're communicating. It's just unwholesome. It's not healthy. It's not good. Some of you need to have the DTR. Reprioritize your relationship with Jesus once again. Give him the first fruits of your day. Make him the most important thing in your life. He's God after all. Some of you, maybe you've been isolating and it's time for you to press back into community. If you're struggling, maybe it's to say, hey, I need help, I need prayer. Reach out to a Christian friend, reach out to us, connect with us. You can do so by texting 94,000, connect with us. We wanna be a church that when we come back together, we are bearing the fruit of the Spirit more than ever before. And that comes down to us leaning in and saying, God, I want your renewal. Would you refine me in this season? And would you reveal the things that I need to repent of? So would you do that this week? Would you lean in with us? And then when we come together, we're gonna be better together and stronger together. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that none of us are alone. I thank you that we aren't hopeless or powerless, but that you give us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Yeah, Lord, thank you for breathing life into every believer. And I ask that you would come once again afresh and anew to every single person listening. God, will we not be people who are afraid of being obedient? Would we not be people who love the world more than we love you? Help us, Lord, to be your representatives and your witnesses just like the early church. God, we want to be a part of revival. Would you start by reviving us? Lord, we love you and we thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, hey, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great week. God bless.